There you have it, 12 episodes in. How are you doing, Paddy Andrews? Very good, very good. Hello, Seven Andy. A nice routine here. Andy Moran, how are you doing? Yeah, all's good. Uh, Connacht champions, we're happy out of down in Mayo today. <laughs> you are delighted, and we're going to get into that in less than a minute, because we've got some big news on the football part of Paddy and Andy. 12 weeks in, 12 episodes in, we're, uh, we're delighted to let you know that for the remainder of the championship, we'll be coming to you a day early. We'll be coming to you every Tuesday now for the rest of the championship. The podcast is going to be available exclusively first on the OTB Sports app. So if you've already got the app, you don't need to do anything different. It's going to appear in the podcast section. If you're following the football pod of Paddy and Andy, it's going to appear there every Tuesday at lunchtime. And you're going to be able to hear Paddy Andrews and Andy Moran talking about whatever happened in that week's Gaelic football. If you haven't got the app yet, just head to the, the app store and you just search for OTB Sports, hit download, get it for free and you'll get it there. And if you're happy enough to get it on a Wednesday, you're going to get it wherever else you're subscribed. So there you have it, lads. We're sorted on a Tuesday. It means we're going to have to get our homework done a day earlier and we're going to be recording <laughs> on a Monday. So uh, did you get to watch enough of Mayo Go? How many times have you watched it back, Andy? No, I watched the highlights back there uh, a couple of hours back and it was, um, yeah, there was ropey moments in it. There's no doubt there was uh, the first half performance we wouldn't be too pleased with. But I think James... I, I think myself and Paddy touched on it over the last couple of weeks. It, it was very difficult for Mayo coming into the game because where was the form guide? Where was the the reality of, you know, who's the best six forwards to pick? Uh, are the best six against Leitrim and Sligo who performed well, don't get me wrong, but then you're going into a right proper test against your oldest rivals and who are the best team to pick? And I think James, like all of us, probably struggled in that in that, in that department at the start, but what a response at halftime. And um, Joe, like as a, as a male supporter now that I am, you'd be very proud of the way they kind of competed there in the second half and took over the game right from the, I say, I suppose the first throw in. The guys that, that turned it, again, we mentioned experience last week, Kevin McLaughlin coming on. First ball, crossfield ball, outside the left foot. Marking a Johnny Heaney, who dominated, really dominated the half-back line in the first half. And Kevin McLaughlin comes in and just kind of takes him out and becomes the most prominent player on the pitch. And it, 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 it was brilliant to see. Paddy Andrews said it was vintage Mayo on OTB AM on Monday morning. And uh, just as you mentioned, Johnny Heaney, I believe Johnny Heaney was the man that was uh, tussling or clashing with Aidan O'Shea going in the tunnel at halftime. Now, it was, it was hard to get a look at what exactly was done there. But... Would that have helped in any way, you know, put a rocket up the Mayo boys and get them going a wee bit, get the get the fires going? Because they were looking in trouble in that second quarter. They didn't score until the 32nd minute. They had gone into the first quarter, a point up, bang, two go-away goals, and they were in trouble. Uh, they were in trouble. There's, there, there, there's no question about it. But I think what happened was, plainly, right, Mayo, would the, would the fight have helped us? like a 15 minutes then to kind of relax it. But what was said going into the tunnel, I'm sure Johnny gave the, the, the old boys a bit of meat, like about, you know, <laughs> struggling in the first half. And What could I be said? Is, uh, that, is that what would have been said, really? Oh, yeah, I think there'd have been a, a bit of, <laughs> Joe, you're, you're in trouble now, or Joe, bits and pieces like that, which would have just caused, like he goes after the six foot five fellow, which I kind of respected, I suppose, you know. But um, yeah, no, I don't, would it have helped second half? I think what really helped me oh, was we got our matchups right in the second half. Absolutely got our matchups right in the second half. We brought on Owen McLaughlin, who gave us unbelievable energy, unbelievable pace. I couldn't believe he didn't start. Yeah. And then we brought on the craftiness of a Kevin McLaughlin, put him on wing forward, put him on a Johnny Heaney, really put him on the back foot. Aidan O'Shea went to full forward. He was decent in the first half, but struggling a tiny bit in around there with Paul Conroy. The influence he had in the second half was huge. And then... I think on top of that, then we got we got a break. We got a break with with, with Comer um, hitting the crossbar. We got a break with Shane Walsh being injured, and we got a break with Sean Kelly being injured. So Mio's performance was brilliant. Second half, we had a better team out in the second half, in my opinion. Goal was first fifteen was seriously depleted by Sean Kelly going off and Shane Walsh getting injured, and then just when it was crucial, you're you're talking right on the margins. It's level. Ball goes in, Comer hits the crossbar, hit the man he's actually marking, runs up the pitch, gives it to, uh, Ushi Mullen has it, runs up the pitch, bang, gives it to Kevin McLaughlin, right foot over the bar. From them going three points in, going into the water break, they're now one, two points down and the game the game is essentially over. Well, they were, they were five points up at half time, and then, yeah, exactly, they were, they were a point down then, 12 minutes into the second half. And he just, Paddy, sorry, before I, before I come to you, I just want to go back to the Mayo man one more time. 
I was massively surprised that Owen McLaughlin didn't start either. And you mentioned there that the subs made a massive difference. We, you, we've been talking for weeks now that we didn't know which of Mayo's six forwards, what were their best six forwards ever since Killian went off injured, um, was it six weeks ago, that we don't know exactly who Horn is going to pick up top. Did he, did he take a chance? Did he get it wrong? Or will he be delighted now that he's come through that and he's figured it out? Or did he know all along? Was that the team that Horn wanted to finish with? James always picks on form. Like always picks on form. And when you're an older player and you need to you need to perform every Saturday in an A versus B game, that becomes very, very difficult. Joe, you know, really then you need the trust. So Darren McHale had scored three six in two games. Man in form, Horn was always going to pick him. Joe you know, Brian Walsh was named to start against Leitrim, didn't start for for whatever reason that was, but was obviously in form before that game. Joe you know, Porik O'Hora obviously showed great form, showed great form the last day. He would always pick the players in form. And that's one thing about uh, James. I, I remember from my time in the squads when you were injured and you were trying to make the team and your neighbours B game the Saturday before the, the next week or the Sunday, seven days out, and you were just thinking, I have no chance here because you couldn't, you, you had to get yourself right or do what you needed to do for seven days later. You couldn't get yourself right for that neighbours B game. So if you're not in form, you're not fit to play, Horn simply won't pick you. He'll pick the fit guys, he'll pick the fellas in form. And that's what he did. And what a luxury it was to have one of our best players over the last decade, 12 years, in Kevin McLaughlin to come off the bench and right mm. from the, the get-go. i seen someone saying everything he did was simplistic today. Outside the left foot uh, pass for Aiden to set up the goal isn't simplistic. Only certain players can do that. The breaking balls that he won, the kick off his, uh, off his wrong side, off his right foot to score the point. Like, he was just, he was really, really brilliant, I thought, when he came on. And, I thought Heaney had such an influence on that game in the first half. McLaughlin totally took his influence out of the game and then started dominating one the other way. So to have him there was a luxury. Uh, what James will do with him now in the next game is, is the intriguing one for me, fans. Paddy, you wore your maroon top last week. Andy Moran was quite disgruntled with, with the carry-on going on there. You mentioned it was vintage Mayo this morning in the second half. Did you really feel like that, yeah? No, genuinely, uh, I did. I, I thought, look, if there was ever an issue with Mayo over the past decade, it was probably what we seen in the first half as well. I thought they struggled up front, you know, and that's, that, that would be a challenge that you would have had it against Mayo at times over the years in, in some of the bigger games. They just found it hard to get scores. And, and to be honest, we're looking at it at half time, they're two, five to six down, you know, it, it was the first test of the season for them. And this was when you're going to see if they're going to miss Killian O'Connor. You know, the first two games, it didn't matter. They were always going to steamroll those uh, those opponents. Their first time up in Crow Park, Tommy Conroy struggling to get scores, Ryan mm. Dunne, who's struggling to get scores, Lee Keegan's even up hitting, hitting wides, and you're just thinking, this is really hurting them now. Aidan O'Shea is the other in the middle, and like, see, Gal, we have their tails up. And you're thinking, it's coming home to roost for James Horan now, and, and, and Cam Porrick, Joyce, this would, this would be a huge win for Galway. But then in the second half, it, it was it was a brilliant, brilliant Mayo performance. So typical of James Horan's Mayo over the past decade at their best. Maybe some of the negatives you see in the first half, like I say, there, there wasn't really cohesion up front. They were struggling to, to break down Galway. But the second half was Mayo at their absolute best. They bullied Galway off the pitch. Like Kevin McLaughlin obviously came in and an impact there, but it was 1-15. to 15. They smothered Galway. They, they pushed up on, on, on Gleason's kickouts. There was the running game that Mayo got from deep. And I thought there was an interesting comment from Joyce after the game. The power of Joyce is a very smart person, a uh, footballer and a coach. He knew that. He said it himself. He goes, we knew Mayo were going to get that running game going. Like say, Oshin Mullen and these guys, uh, Lee Keegan, and Matty Rowan had a phenomenal game. Mm. With Dublin, any time we played Mayo, that was the, the first and foremost. You need to deal with the runners from deep. Like back in our day, it was it was Colin Boyle, it was Donny Vaughan, it was Keith Higgins, Paddy Durkin. You have to stop those guys because it's such a huge platform for Mayo going forward. I think that's the really impressive thing that James Horn has done. I touched on it this morning, but with Nathan. They still have that style of play despite the change in the personnel. Like Lee Keegan's is playing a little bit deeper. He still marauds forward, probably not to the same extent when he was at his peak at 16 and 17, but you guys like Oshie Mullen, Paddy Durkin, Matty Moran, driving forward, Aidan O'Shea switch into full forward. We said having him in there frees up space for Conroy and O'Donoghue. 
younger forwards who probably were struggling a little bit in the first half, all of a sudden Aidan O'Shea goes in there and there's havoc mm. in the goal with full back line. And even though he's not a big scorer, it's no coincidence that the other guys start getting a little bit more space and start clipping scores themselves. But the absolute, the fundamental of, of where that game turned was the athleticism, the direct running game of Mayo. And how many times have we said that that is Mayo at their absolute best in Crow Park under James yeah. Horan? And, and like I said, despite the huge turnover in personnel, I think James Horan deserves phenomenal credit. And I touched on this. Jim Gavin did a spectacular job with Dublin. His genius was to continuously win all Ireland despite turning over players. That great players, brilliant players for Dublin were coming to the end of their career but they were just phased out and a new younger guy comes in and the show was kept on the road. There was no drop off in standards. You know, Bernard Brogan, Dermot Connolly, Paul Flynn, these guys were moving on and Dublin kept winning. That, that, that takes balls from a manager to make those calls and it takes a really strong culture for young players to come in and perform. And James Horn, it's nearly gone under the radar a bit. There's yeah. been a massive turnover in the Mayo panel. They made the All-Ireland final last year and nobody expected them to make it and they put it up to Dublin. They're back in the All Ireland semi final again for the 10th time in 11 seasons, despite huge turnover, despite missing arguably their best player and the most important player, including O'Connor. But the show is still on the road. And, and that was, it's just, it's serious balls from now to their second half performance. They just stood up to the challenge. And on the flip side, that's always the question mark you have with Galway. And no team likes having that question mark over them, that inconsistency. Yes, Galway have really talented players. I was myself and Andy were chatting earlier. Like, Galway are inconsistent from game to game. They're actually inconsistent within the same game. <laughs> you know, the one half they can be really strong, and like I say, they have Mayo on the ropes. And Sean, or Shane Walsh is very. We were touched on Daniel Flynn last week. Shane Walsh has X factor, and he he just he has a couple of big moments, an unbelievable run, burns Paddy Durkin for Comer's goal, and you're thinking this Galway have arrived, and in the second half it's just a complete meltdown. But, but I'd actually give more credit to, to Mayo as opposed to Galway's collapse. I just thought their athleticism, their aggression and intensity, they, they just smothered them all the pitch. And it was brilliant for Mayo. And, and they'll have their serious pep of their step uh, for an all Ireland semi-final in a few weeks' time. It's, it's going to be interesting, definitely. I just jump in there. Okay, no, Tommy, go just, on first, Andy. Yeah. Just with James Warren's record, I think it, it, it is worth mentioning. This is his seventh year as Mayo manager for the first time. This is his third in seven of them years, he's won six kind of titles. I know that with Dublin's achievements, that sounds very little, but like in Mayo, that's huge. And then in the year he didn't win it, he won a National League title. Like So it, it definitely is worth mentioning. That's that's a serious turnover of success within a county. But, but, but you know, Andy, I would say, he pro- I don't think he probably gets the credit for that. I think that the story is always when Mayo falls short. That, that they haven't got oh, over yeah. the line, yeah. that, that they haven't won that Ireland. But James Horn has done an absolutely phenomenal job there. And, and like I say, again, last year, they lose the all Ireland final and people said, oh, Mayo have lost the final again. That was brilliant for Mayo to get to the final with the turnover of players. I was, yeah. I, 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 and again, they're in Division 2 this year and you're thinking, and, and to be honest, we were thinking as well, there were seven or eight key guys gone in the space of two weeks back in yeah. January and you're thinking, is, is this the end of Mayo? Like People are writing off Mayo for, for five, six, seven years. And, and with Dublin, I remember we bet them in, in a couple of finals and we thought that that's Mayo gone now. And really? Did you year, did you feel that yourself? Yeah, I, I, I think when we won in 16, we thought that that was a big defeat for Mayo. It was a hard defeat for them. And sure enough, the next year, they'd be all Ireland final again. And they easily could, could win that game in 17. They're back again. And last year's all, all Ireland final. And that's, like you say, that, that's the ball, the mentality that, that James Horn and the Mayo players bring to it. And even yesterday, it was... Despite the change of personnel and it's young, younger players, it's now, let's say, Paul Gahora coming in, Oshin Mullen, Matthew Aran, they're now driving the team forward. Uh, your man, I'll, do, I'll just throw someone in there as well, uh, Paddy, because he's such a big leader. Young Rhino O'Donnell. He's brilliant. He's, he's yeah. He has a bit about him, doesn't he? Yeah, he has, I, uh, yeah. yeah. He's that, you he's, can see it in him, yeah. The, the, what, and someone described him to me today, the right level of cockiness. <laughs> yeah, he yeah, looks he, like he, he has it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he has a bit of a head on him there. Yeah, yeah. You, can, you get that sense from him, definitely. He was very, he, he was very deep are, at times. carrying the Mayo torch that, that has been brought by, by iconic Mayo players of the past decade. And, and let's say, there wasn't a real change in game plan. It was Mayo of the last 10 years. Athleticism. Yeah. Just 
ran Galway into the ground, just bullied them, taking the but ball off them. Can I jump in uh, there? You're, you're talking about bullying, and you've mentioned it a few times. And they did, yeah, because they did. But before the match, right? And I'm going to stretch here in a second, and you can both dismiss me if you want and say, uh, you know, I, I'm wrong. But before the you match, never do that to your topic. Rob Finnerty is going into his position. He's sauntering over, and Padre Gohora nails him three or four times. I don't think Rob Finnerty was ready for it. Um, he now, Finnerty goes off with an injury, and I watched it back a few times. I'm not going to say that O'Hara meant to clip him. It was when Conroy fisted the ball over the bar. It was an accidental collision. He went off. Um, Sean Kelly pulls his hamstring. Nothing to see there. And then Shane Walsh has to get an injection in his shoulder at half time. And poor Rick Joyce was losing the head on the sideline when this happened. And you can see it back in the replay. I actually misattributed mis- <laughs> it to Lee Keegan this morning. It wasn't. It was Padraig O'Hara. Um, Walsh runs across him and O'Hara slams him to the ground. Now, I don't know, was that the dark arts? But I would argue that Mayo have that. And Galway, when you mentioned that inconsistency, Galway have never really shown that bite. Yes, Damien Comer would give it. But who else has given it in that Galway team? Mayo have consistently done it. Yeah, I, like, <laughs> I, I, I don't think that's um, I don't think that's dark arts. I think that's just been been physical. I think the, the Sean Kelly one is a hamstring. I think that's very unlucky. Um, and at that time we were struggling, Tommy. It wasn't that that's what turned us back into the game. No, Shane, Shane Walsh when Shane Walsh tries to black tries to block him, and Porik Kohora just kind of sorts that out himself. Um, legally or illegally sorted out the Rob Finner 2-1 is, is, is bad luck like, but you know, Tommy Conroy gets turned over one time is that dark arts from, like, I don't think it's it's getting into the point where it's the last minute of the game and you're being cynical and you're, you're, you're working down the clock and stuff like that I think it's more of that's the physicality within the game um, I think Shane Walsh was unlucky the way he landed I think Rob Ferenty was very unlucky and Sean Kelly pulled his hamstring. I don't think... Was, was there, maybe I'm stretching uh, a wee bit just to, from watching Dublin last week, but like, how come Galway aren't doing that? Like, Mayo had the run in them. They absolutely had the run in them. Why, why is there Tommy, nothing happening Tommy, in the second half? From my point of view, playing Mayo and, and over the years, and this is why Galway should expect this. If you're playing Mayo in Crow Park in the game, you, you need to be physically ready. Hmm. That, that, like, that should not come as a surprise that like we played in some of the most intense games against each other over, over the years if we were playing Mayo you knew a 100% you needed to be ready you, you were going to be you're going to be hit it's going to be flat to the mat and maybe that's maybe that's the inexperience and the naivety of Galway that that's that inconsistency they're, they're, they're on they're in the early stages of a journey with Paul with Joyce and, and like, like they just weren't ready for that but you should be if you're playing Mayo in a big game in Crow Park you need to be ready that it's going to be physical. And to be honest, not just Mayo. Yeah. I'm, I'm not in no way is this a criticism. This is, I am praising. If you're playing the top teams and you're serious about being provincial champions and, and being at the top table, like Kerry do it, Tyrone do it, Dublin do it, for all the, the, the fancy stuff and, and the good play we have, like Kerry absolutely bullied Cork yesterday 100%. in the second half, half as well. The amount of times they turned them over down the centre channel. Tyrone, Tyrone do it. They're probably more than now for, but, but Dublin definitely do it. John Small, James McCarthy, Philip McMahon. If you're serious about being a top team, you've got to be able to deal with that. Yeah, I just to be. I just thought it was a bad sign in 25 minutes. When okay, Kelly's holding his hamstring. That's fair. Conroy is down after taking a shot. Shane Walsh is lying on the ground and crying at the ref because Keegan has pushed him off the ball. There was three Galway men lying on the ground at once there after 25 minutes, and I know to get the goal a minute later, but I just didn't see that fight there that Mayo were able to bring. But 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 Tommy, okay, dark arts is when and like I, I think we should throw the question back at you. Like you're 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 saying here about kind of little moments within the game, which were just mm. moments, and Paddy's explaining them eloquently there, I think, by saying there were physical contacts. Now, dark arts would be if Shane Walsh is burning you up the right hand sideline and you take him out of the game. That's a dark art instead yeah. of letting him run in on goal. Do you know what I'm saying? That you're you're being cute. Like I don't think there was Anthony like Paul Conroy takes a shot off his left foot and someone goes in to tackle him, leaves a bit on him at the end. That's not a dark art. That's defending. Yeah. Okay. You know what I'm saying? There's, I, I think there's a difference. Paul O'Hara was probably too aggressive with Shane Walsh. But like Shane Walsh tries to block him off. Is Shane Walsh using a dark art by you know, standing across him and blocking him off? You know, and what, like, I ask you, like I said, what did you want Galway to do in that 20 minutes? How did I'm, you want them to slow it down? How, like, but tell me. I, I, I don't know, but... Do something like last week when Mead, last week when Mead had the run on on Dublin. You know there there was there was 
players lying down or was James oh, McCarthy oh. got, got oh. involved in a scuffle and something from, happened. From, from my point of view on it, Galway don't score until the 60, from half time to the 61st. Mm. Yeah. Like, and they had a lot of 20, chances. Like, 26 minutes, you don't score in, in a game. Again, the, and when you can call it physicality, you can call it street smarts, mm. you can call it anything you want. That is just naivety and inexperience. Yep. Even if you're playing porn, no team, no team. Dublin at their absolute best. Kerry even, everyone's talking about Kerry is the top team in the country now. The first quarter yesterday, they were really poor. No team dominates for 70 minutes at all, particularly when you get to the latter stages of the championship. How you manage momentum when you're not playing well is essential to, to being successful. You cannot go 26 minutes without scoring. Taking bad options, letting the team get a run on you. This is the point I was making with Andy McAtee last week, kind of, kind of tongue in cheek, kind of challenging Dublin and saying, "Oh, well, they, they were slowing things down, or or Dublin keep the ball for six minutes at the end of the game." That's because they're not playing well at that time, and they they're totally aware of that. That's experience to say, "Okay, even though we're not shooting the lights out, we're at our peak here. We are limiting the damage we're taking here. That we're not even if we're all over the shop for ten minutes." We're going to keep the ball. We're going to slow things down. We're only going to concede two or three points. You cannot go 26 minutes without scoring. Like that's that, that naivety. That's inexperience there. So, so don't, don't be saying dark arts and nonsense like that. It's Mayo understanding the game. And this is, again, this is James Horan and those experienced players that even they've got younger players coming through, they control that game. And you look at what, what, what Kerry did yesterday, don't play really well in the first quarter. They're struggling. Brian Hurley's hot. Jason Foley's struggling. They just keep it, keep calm, limit the damage there. And then they, they, they clip a couple of easy scores. Thomas Sullivan gets up and kicks a couple of points. Galway couldn't do that. No. There was just like, they didn't know what to do. There was, and there's two examples. If you look towards the end, it's actually in the last 10, 15 minutes. It's Paul Conroy and Peter Cook. They literally just kicked the ball away about 50 yards wide. They're about 45, 50 yards out from goal. They have no options. They've completely and utterly run out of ideas. They're being tackled by Mayo lads and they literally just kicked the ball away over the end line. That, that was just two snapshots of where goal were at. They could not handle what Mayo were bringing for that entire second half. Outscored by two eight to three points. And that, like, like lads, it could have been more. Like there was yeah. like James, James Carr's goal chance. Uh, Omar McLaughlin forces a great save for Conor Gleeson. Like, like they could have been absolute, they were obliterated, but it could have been worse. And that's inexperience, it's naivety. And that's what Galway have to address. They've lovely players. They always have. But that's they, kind that, of what I was getting at. That was a lesson okay. yesterday in the second half. But, but, but Paddy, like once Walsh goes out of the game, it's it, it's literally all over for Galway. Like they're, they're relying, me and Paddy, even though he took the wrong decision up in Monon, we have defended him because we were saying they're so reliant on him. Yeah. They can't actually give out to him for taking the wrong decision because they are that reliant on him. And if the, the proof was ever in it, it was yesterday. As soon as he goes out of the game, there's no one to go out into the middle of the field to hand the ball to, to slow the game down, to put pace into it. Joe, there's none of that. Now, on your point, Paddy, or Tommy, is that the best place to be cynical is from the restarts. And what Paddy is just after saying there is they don't score. So it's very hard then to get it, like... Structure. There, a okay. structure to be yeah. actually to get into position to cynical because if you're being cynical while a player is running through you're getting a black card and you're down for yeah. 10 minutes and sure that's not being smart and then you've Gleason on the other side absolutely struggling with his kick out like in the first 10 minutes he's three out over the line after I think it was 11 minutes three out over the sideline so there's no real base either on the Mio side in the second half or on the Galo side to get that structure into place to get someone into a headlock to get them like to slow the game down so I, I think you're being overemphasizing the Mio side okay. and I think it's it was harder for Galway to do that and they probably have never been in that real high pressure situation yet and when we all put them in there, they didn't know what to do with it. Uh, and but, just on that, Andy, sorry, at that point and how important that is, we would have definitely would have focused on it with Dublin over the years. You want to get up for an opposition kicker. Even if you're not playing well, if you kick a score or even if you kick a wide, that allows you to get your structure back up up front. That's it, that you get your, your six forwards into the positions, you get your half backs to push up your midfielders. All of a sudden, the game's in there, the opposition's half. Now. Even if it's a wide, it allows you to get eight to ten players up the pitch 
and try and force the game in their half. And look, we've touched that, and we touched on that, particularly in the episode we're talking about Stephen Crooks. And yeah, it like the kickouts are, are just they have become arguably the most important play in GAA in the last four or five years. Yesterday's another example. You see, Cork had no kickout plan in the Munster final. Michael Martin and then Mark White come on and just kick it out long, and Kerry have twelve guys up and. They just obliterate them. And that's the foothold in the game. And, and they steamrolled them. You look at what Dublin do to teams, the success they get. And you look at what Mayo did yesterday, the, the poor Connor Gleeson. It's a hard thing for keepers. You know, if, if, if you haven't got movement, if you haven't got a structure there, and you're a little bit nervous yourself, the top teams sense blood. There's such a focus on it in modern Gaelic football. Um it's just so, so important. And, and, and if you're struggling on that strategy and you can see it with Galway, yes, you can see it with Cork, you, you just haven't got a chance. You, you, you just cannot get a foothold in the game. And as well as everything else, Mayo just obliterated that in the second half as well. Okay, yeah, yeah, spot on. I've been told. I'll take it. <laughs> All right. I, I, I admit it, I was stretching going into it. Last question on Galway. We're going to be talking about the benches later on. We're going to be talking about the options coming off the bench for different teams. When Finnerty went off, he brings on Finian O'Lee. Um, when Kelly bring, goes off, he brings on Jack Lane, who, who had been their under-20 captain before. You were looking at the Galway bench, and there didn't seem to be too many options there. And now, there's a, a number of players who aren't on the panel at the minute for, for various reasons. Killian McDade, who'd been in Australia. Michael Daly, an under-21 winner a couple of years ago. Fintan O'Curran, big midfielder, could have been an option in there. John Daly, Ian Burke. Former All Star Adrian Varley would have played a lot of football as well under Kevin Walsh at Galway. That's that's a decent list of lads between the age of twenty four and I'd say twenty nine that aren't there for Galway at the minute. Yeah, you're yeah, talking about Mayo maximising and yeah. turn over, turnover over players. That's a big turnover of players there. Poor Joyce is dealing with. Yeah, you could add. I, I suppose you could add. Um, John Danny Cummins to that. You could probably add one or two more. You could add. Um, Farrer from Curra Finn, uh, right good player as well. So, Farrer was on the bench. Farrer, come on, laid on. Oh, the, sorry, I'm, I'm another Farrer. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the you could add a few to it. So it's a yeah, it's 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 a tricky one for for Porrick. The, the, the one with Sean Kelly, we have to give, I suppose, a bit of background to this. To have a plan, Kelly goes to midfield at the start. He is Mark and Aidan O'Shea. Now, when he goes off, lads, we I think we myself and Paddy have talked about Sean Kelly in this pod enough. He's a top quality operator. Like mm. he's and like I, I think I described it too. Like he's he's got a bit of balls to him. Like where he's he's not afraid to give it to you. Like you know to to actually you're on about someone to be cynical and physical. He is probably that player for Galway. If I'm being honest, the Finnerty one is different. I, I couldn't understand the Finnerty situation. Conroy puts the ball over the bar and makes it four three to Mayo. So that his goal was third point, and Finnerty goes off, accidental collision. I'd say he's done serious damage to his foot or his ankle. And to bring on Fintan O'Lee there, I think it's it's a strange one for me. Like, you're looking around and you're you're in a good position. Galway would have taken 4-3 in Crow Park against Mio after 14 minutes, without question. And then they have to change a bit of the structure of the team because O'Lee is more of a, a workman-like wing forward, stroke wing back. And he'd also been dropped for Cahill Sweeney. And he'd, he'd been dropped for Sweeney, who was a direct replacement for him. So you're taking away, like, in that match, Finnerty was playing at the highest point of the goal mm. attack. And to pull him and to put on a different it means you have to change the structure of your team, which leaves a bit of imbalance. Probably was okay until Kelly had to go off and was definitely struggling with it once Shane Walsh gets injured. And then the reason for doing that switch substitution becomes unusual. You have Desi Keneally sitting there, Keneally sitting behind you, inside forward, played for them last year in the kind of final. And not to use him at that point, I thought it was a very strange call. We're, we're tight in time here. We're half an hour in. I have one last question on the Mayo Galway game. Paddy, I'm going to go to Andy on it because you mentioned it this morning. You'd love to see a Maddie Ruan, Brian Fenton matchup at some stage. We may get it in the All-Ireland semi-final. We'll come to the preview of the Dublin Kildare game a little later. Andy Moran, would you like to see that? Because I have a question about that because I've always seen Jack Barry as Brian Fenton's kryptonite and I would consider Jack Barry and Matty Ruan to be quite different in their style of play. Ah, they're very different in their style of play. Matty is an attacker. Um, he's the seventh forward. Um, I taught himself in German in the first half. I think we scored six in the first half. 
I think they were directly involved with four of them scores either a score or assist between the two of them I thought they were brilliant around the middle of the field when we like when the game Paddy was a game I thought them two were the were the two boys mm. that kept me on it the Brian Fenton uh, Matty Ryan one I think is very interesting I think Matty did really well Paddy at the start of last year's final first 20-25 minutes mm. and then Fenton just grew and grew and grew into the game Matty's another year older uh, another year more experienced he's been Mio's best player by yeah. a country mile this year in yeah. every single game that I've seen against Clare, Westmead, the, he's been brilliant. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting. I'd love to see it myself. Uh, if Kildare beat Dublin, I'd take that also. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you have to get that in this week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to get it in. But it's uh, no, it'd be a fascinating battle. And I think it's a battle that every midfielder now worth their salt, every young midfielder, Wants to wants the battle American Fenton because he is the ultimate litmus test. Like he is the guy. If you want to take the throne at the minute in midfielders, he's the king, and you just have to go after him. Do you know, he hasn't lost the game. But but that's Matthew Ryan. You're right. Another year under his belt. You can see younger players coming through. It probably takes them a year or two to, to, to get their feet together, and that's what May would have learned a lot from, from that all Ireland final. So that's why it was a brilliant achievement to get there for those younger players. Oh, McLaughlin, O'Shea, Mullen, Matthew Ryan. That, that there's a big experience to be taken from that. You can just see all through the national league. Yesterday in Crow Park, he, he's embracing it. He, he loves being in Crow Park. And Mayo at the best have players that love playing in Crow Park, and you can just see his athleticism. And, and look. look the first thing, if you're trying to deal with someone like that, then you need to have athleticism. You need to be able to run for 75 minutes because he can. And you can do all the skills, you can do all the hard work as well. But if you can't run for 75 minutes, like I say, you might get 20 minutes on him, but he's going to wear you down. And that's, that might get to the stage, they might even pick each other up. They might, might say, look, we want to try and get Matthew Rand going forward and we want to put someone else on. on yeah. On. So, so it'd be interesting to see. And look, Dublin obviously have to do a job this weekend, first and foremost. But, I just think he's he's such an exciting player for Mayo, and he's just a typical Mayo player. And it's just, he's, a, he's, he's a Mayo. R- yeah. r- he's a, he's the most Mayo Mayo player. <laughs> yeah, he but he, he's he's that athleticism and like the Crow Park thing. People thought like, it was Crow Park in the double. Crow Park in the the Mayo playing playing there yesterday. They have a style of play and players that that pitch suits them down to the ground. They always always perform in Crow Park, and um, so so yeah. Look, we'll see. Fingers crossed, we do see it in, in, in a couple of weeks' time, but like I said, there, there's a couple of things to get through before that. You're listening to episode 12 of the Football Pod with Paddy Anders and Andy Moran. Hit subscribe if you haven't already. We're going to move south. We're going to go to Killarney. We're going to go to Kerry Cork. And I'm going to jump forward to the 28th minute because we, we had a lot of crack this morning winding up the Kerry boys for uh, trying to talk up the Cork chances all week, trying to talk down their own chances. <laughs> they are in outrageous form. And I know... Um, I was trying to make the case last week. Is there a chance that things have been too easy for them and could they get spooked? I didn't really believe it. From the 20th minute to the 60th minute of this game, Kerry outscored Cork by 22 points to one. Now, we are seeing this trend a little bit, you know, in, in terms of Mayo second half there against Galway. They destroyed them in every aspect of the game. But physically, it was quite alarming. You know, in terms of athleticism, Paddy. Um, yeah. Like, uh, where, where do you want to start with Kerry Cork? Um, I ex- I expected this. We touched on it last week and kind of tongue in cheek that the, look, Kerry were going to win this game convincingly, and they did. The interesting thing was probably the first quarter that I was like Jesus, Cork got a got a really good start. Brian Hurley and and his brother were causing this. I think he scored one four in the first quarter. Brian Hurley scores scores one two and it's causing Jason Foley all sorts of problems. And, and we, we looked at Jason Foley as probably Kerry's best back this year. Yeah. So far, he seemed like he'd really kicked on um, from last year and was establishing himself. So that's an interesting thing for Kerry going forward. That let's like, see. I, I think they play Toronto in All Ireland semi final and they're going to get tested on, on, on who's going to man mark guys like McCurry and, uh, and Maddie Donnelly I know, we'll preview the Ulster final separately but, but that was an interesting thing that okay they were struggling there up front as clinical as Kerry had been they had a couple of goal chances which to make a bit of a hames with Sean O'Shea and David Clifford and you're thinking Jesus is this is something going to go awry again for the second year in a row but, but as I was saying unlike Galway Kerry had that kind of awareness that they can just say okay Hasn't been a great start for us, but we'll just keep plugging away. They always had the benefit of being on top of the kickouts 
and that's having Jack Barry in there alongside uh, David Moore and that, that they were forcing Cork along they were putting four guys in the full forward line uh, and Michael Martin was just like banging out log and you've got two brilliant fielding midfielders in, in Jack Barry and David Moore so that gave them a foothold of the game and then they just started clipping scores Thomas Woodham gets up for a couple <laughs> Sean O'Shea starts clipping them and once it gets to that point and, and like the third quarter is the big one I, I think what is it 3-3 three, three to no score in the first Rootless. playoff 13, 13 minutes of the second half um, and they just obliterate the kickouts again and Cork just but Cork could change your keeper like Cork could change your keeper well, half boy, kicks the ball out David Moore wins it yeah. straight out for a goal they put the ball down they kick the next one out long to Jack Barry breaks it down another goal and it's just like Jesus Christ would somebody please do something different here but the, the first quarter was a wor- worry for Kerry you look and say okay their matchups were probably a little, they were struggling a little bit there. Clifford obviously has a bit of a quiet day, which is so rare. But then the worrying thing that they still score, they still up record a huge score. And, and, and Clifford only scores one free. So it's hilarious. It, 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 it is what we expected from that game. There wasn't a whole pile to learn from it. And, and there hasn't been a whole pile in the whole Munster Championship. Kerry, there's serious hunger there. There's serious athleticism. They, like I say, they just kept turning Cork over. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'll be ugly. You see Killian Spillane coming on and getting a diving block on his own 13. You know, that's one of their, their out and out scoring forwards. You can just see a mentality with Kerry. And we touched on it in one of the earlier pods. Tommy, you were saying after the Dublin Kerry game in Turles, you, you know, Kerry look angry. And I said, well, they, but well, they should be. You know, mm. they threw away. They wasted a year of their careers last year. They completely, they should, never should have lost the court. Where Cork and Kerry are at right now, that's a true reflection yesterday. Kerry are that much better than them. So, so losing last year was a complete shambles. You can see that in their intensity and their attitude from every game they've played this season through the National League and what they've done in the Munster Championship. And they have been really impressive, but they look at that first quarter and I think particularly, you know, it's the cream of the crop now when they, they play the All-Ireland semi-final and potentially an All-Ireland final. That there's little things there that, that they might be certainly looking at. Uh, particularly Jason Foley was a worry there on Hurley. Yeah, um, we have a question in about that. We have a question in about Jason Foley, Paddy. And I know you picked him out as one of your shining players in the league this year, but will Jason Foley stay at full back? Con could do far worse than him than Brian Hurley did. Now, well, I, I think Dublin did in that second quarter on Turles. You know, that was Dub- Dublin really only played for, for, for that kind of 10 or 15 minutes in that game. Yeah. And they racked up 2 3 or 2 4, and they had a couple of other goal chances as well. That is going to be the challenge for Kerry. That, that, like, that, there is no doubt, even like say Clifford has an off day yesterday, they are going to rack up big scores against mm. anyone they play against. The question mark over Kerry is, like I say, if they play, I think they play Tyrone and Lawler in semi final, Maddie Donnelly, Carl McShane coming back, Darren McCurry's in the form of his life. Can their full back line shut down the top, top forwards? That's always been the question mark with Kerry. If they're going to win the All-Ireland, I think they'll need to do that against Thrown. I think they'll need to do it against Dublin. I don't think scoring is ever going to be an issue for them with the quality they have up front. But with Jason Foley, uh, look, I, I, think, I think he's just struggled at, at the outset. Brian O'Boogie left actually did a brilliant job. Uh, who I would have had question marks over. I thought he did a really good job of Hurley after that. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know who else you put in there, to be honest. Um, so... And I think, look, just like, like, as much as Clifford had a bit of an off day yesterday, maybe Jason Foley just had an off day. I, I think he's done enough over the, the course of the season to date to, to merit that that he'll be there in the All Ireland semi final, uh, whoever they're playing. Andy, I suppose we were we were kind of scratching our heads a wee bit over the last couple of weeks, wondering when Paul Murphy was going to get into the Kerry fifteen. Um, yeah. Were you thinking before throw in when you heard that Jack Barry was being brought in and that Paul Murphy was being brought in that? What, what, what were you thinking that Peter Kim was doing there? Did you think it was a positive, two positive changes to make? Now, it obviously made the 15 stronger, but before the game, were you thinking this is a positive move or are Kerry worried here? Well, I don't think the Murphy one was a big, big call. It was direct, it was a direct for change for Crowley. Mm. Like it wasn't, wasn't the, the big call was Barry. And again, just I, I suppose we rehashing on different pods that we've talked through. I think we've talked about the protection David Moore needs. Mm. Um, no, I think it was, there was more to it than just that because I think on their kickout strategy they use Jack Barry a lot, yeah. and also on the court kickout strategy as as um, Paddy was saying, having four big men across the middle, and Crowley or Gavin White isn't small either. Having them four men across the pitch it w- was a big benefit to them as well. Um, 
and it it took out it took out some of the the arrows the cork hit them with last year. You know, but but my thing would be um, the the big thing I was thinking at, at the start was the amount of legs it's going to give Kerry. Like the amount of like, did you see Jack Barry's run for Brian O'Begley's goal? Yeah, like it was literally like Paddy was saying out of the Dublin textbook, like. I seen James McCarthy making that run on David Moore in 2019, or t- yeah, 2019 final. He would just run straight for the, and it just, like, you have to go with him because if you give it to Jack Barry, he's got a good chance of scoring. Maguire mm. runs, do, not even looking at the ball, and Sean Powder is just like, turn around, Maguire, you know, and he doesn't, <laughs> and it goes straight in for goal. And that, it just gave them an athleticism. And where Cork really benefited from big kick out to, last year, break, Powder in winning it breaking up play in the West. Kerry were just plucking, plucking, blocking fellas off, giving fellas free catches. And it was just over and over and over again. And Cork didn't seem to have another plan once that plan kind of failed on them. So um, you seen Murphy, you seen Murphy and Jack Barry during the first half, getting little turnovers, doing reckless things like Jack Barry possibly could have got a black card, mm. possibly should have got a black card, if I'm being honest. But when they got into the into the game and they started moving, I think they really they added something to the Kerry team. And when Jeremy O'Connor, Jack Barry, and David Moore were there uh, around the middle of the field, even though Cork were still doing well at that point, I thought it gave them a really good structure that that, that they can actually build from going forward. We we have a question in on around Cork in a minute that we're going to get to. Paddy, can I ask you a question about that David Clifford performance? <laughs> Nothing really to be alarmed about, but. Without knowing David Clifford personally, do you think he might use that as a bit of motivation to turn up the next day? Would it change his performance in any way, or do you think he's matured enough to to say? It? No, well, I, I don't think so. Look, like we've all had, and David Clifford's a far better player than us two, us two shams there on this podcast. Um, it, we've all had days like that. You could just see there was. You could see he was getting frustrated as well because Kerry were racking up such huge scores. <laughs> And it seemed like I played in games like that, <laughs> Lancer Championship games, where you can run, you can run nearly 10k, and you, the ball just doesn't come to you. And it, if you just stand still for two minutes, it'll come, Jenny, you'll score three points in a row. And you could see definitely in the second half, he was getting frustrated and probably started trying to force things a little mm. bit. He had a couple, like he, like he fouled one on the ground, he lost one on contact, he kicked a bad boy, incredible way for him. Gainey gave it to him with his left foot in the second half. He obviously had the goal chance at the start, which you'd have put your house on him and, and, and tried to go across Michal Martin and just it didn't get across it enough and he saved it. It was just one of those days. I think that's, I can't remember a game like that for him. I, like I, I said it this morning uh, with, with Nathan. Even if he plays poorly, he still knows he scores four or five points for play. That's his level. That's how good he is. I would say I would have absolutely no qualms with, with David Clifford going up to Crow Park in the All Ireland semi final. I think he'd be back to his, back to his it's, best. It's, but what would he look at? I, I I would say he's probably just a little bit a little bit frustrated at how it went. I thought maybe his handling was a little bit off. Like I say, he got turned over a couple of times, fumbled, fumbled a couple of times. But you have to give credit to, to Sean Meehan as well from Cork because yeah. like that's a tough gig, but it's also a tough gig when you're being absolutely annihilated everywhere else over the pitch. You, you know, it's not like you're on top and there's only three or four balls coming in like. Balls are being reined in into that full back line all day. And Sean Mean, his head did not drop. He, he stuck to his task and did a really good job. But for Clifford, look, I wouldn't say he'd, he'd even review that game. It's just move on. He'll be back to his best in, in, in two weeks' time. So I don't think Peter Keane's going to be giving him too much lip, I'd imagine. Sure, look, I, I'm sure Bridget's had the same crack the whole time growing up. If one Andrews didn't deliver, the other Andrews would, would turn up and deliver. Well, <laughs> oh, so. If the two of us were ever there, we'd have to do well be on the same pitch at the same time. But... Now, a slightly different scenario now, Bridget, than David Clifford for Kerry now, I have to say. Andy, we, we sat in, in Castle Bar together watching Mayo Leitrim, and uh, it was a tough watch. And um, I suppose you could say we, we felt quite sorry for the Leitrim lads that they seemed, I suppose, out of the depth in ways. We've been sent in an official correspondence from the county of Leitrim. I think you want to read it out. I've sent it on to you there if you want to read it. You have a clearer voice to me, do you? No, you go for it. <laughs> pass in the book, the hospital pass. Say, Andy, you might uh, address a subject for me when you were talking to Paddy and Tommy on the next pod. I accept Leitrim have a world of work to do, and we are not capable of competing with the Mayo's of this world at the minute. We will get there, though, in my opinion. Uh, (laughs) However, the reaction to Cork's defeat yesterday has not raised a murmur 
compared to the hysteria that created Leitrim's defeat, seems it doesn't meet the national media's attention. Why is that? It seems like it's an easy solution to everyone's problem to get rid of the minnows to an alternative comp competition so they can be forgotten. The GA have a massive issue of one of the largest counties uh, aren't there to compete. I'd appreciate a bit of balance to your conversation. Leitrim beaten by 24, Cork beaten by 22. When you put it like that, phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but I, it, like, it, and I, like I only received the text in the last hour, but it, mm. it, 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 I think it's a very fair point of view. Um, and if you're from Leitrim and Sligo, you must be looking at the, the scoreline yesterday and say... Where's the where's the question marks about Cork here? Where's the Joe you know, the hysteria uh, going around a Division One team beating a Division Two team by the level they did? And I think it's a very very fair point. And if we me and Paddy were here and we're on about championship restructures and little bits and pieces like that, would we put Cork in the like in the second tier? Would we put them in the Tommy Murphy or the Paddy O'Shea? Or well, they they were in they were in Division. If they didn't get out of Division Three this year, they would have been, wouldn't they? Well, it would have been. Well, the, like Cork are never going to stand for that, like, do you know? So I, I think that is some part of the some part of the problem. I think it's a very fair point. Now, again, I said last week I de most definitely do not have the solution, but I think that raises a very good point on, on where the structures are going to go down. No, no way. it does, Andy. I like saying if you go down the road of, of say what we were talking about, and there's there's a 16 team Sam McGuire and there's Division One and Two. If Cork aren't in Division Two, well, they're not there on merit. And you know what I mean? Yes, I get that they're one of the biggest counties in the tradition they have. But but that is a, a, an unbelievably valid point. That that we know there's a huge gap. And like I say, we touched on on this part from, from day one. Everyone, particularly the Gaelic football champions, probably waiting for for now <laughs> that, that, that you're getting down to like like the top three or four teams because there's just there's not. There's probably not. Like people are giving up with super, it's competition. probably not. There's probably not eight super teams well, with the super eight, so it, it is a challenge across the board. But I do think it, that, that that is a very valid point. That, like, even before yesterday, my, my thoughts on that game going in and previewing that Kerry would win that game by you did say that, yeah, would win convincingly, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and and they did. Um, but they've, so they've beaten Galway and Tyrone by, by similar enough margins and I know it's the league I know it's the league and it is a good comparison between Cork and Leitrim because you couldn't find two more opposite counties in the country um, but but, can, can I just ask Paddy a question on that the the third quarters Paddy mm. right in the two games yesterday both te defeated teams failed to score I, I, I don't know if that's a telling stat in terms of Joe where counties are at I know you've had a You've had a point before about teams coming up and down and moving yeah. between the divisions and stuff like that, but it's a fairly kind of like that. Like the third quarter is the like we know it. Me and you, <laughs> I think the only scored a point in the third quarter the last day themselves. So yeah, yeah. Do you it, know it, 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 it's an interesting trend. Definitely, if you you think eighteen minutes after half time, you, you know the teams are in there and they've all their tactics at half time. Mm. They're going to come out, particularly Galway, whatever about. Cork were five points down at half time and they'd had their purple patch. You know, the the die was cast by that stage for Cork. Kerry were already yeah. on top. But for Galway, it was just it was it was a more interesting rumble. But it, it's such a, a crucial, crucial time mm -hmm. in the game that it's you know, the, the, the Aussie Real Estate used to call it the championship quarter. And when you yeah. come out, you put your foot in their throats. That's that's it. That sets your stall up for the final 10, 15 minutes. Like um, but, but there's no getting away from like conditioning of the top top teams does seem to be way further ahead. Like you're seeing it, it's kind of clear and obvious. Like we touched on it, the physique of the Kerry players, it's so noticeable that, that you can see them coming back after lockdown, that they look physically stronger. Like see, they just bullied Cork. They were taking the ball off them so many times in the second half down the centre channel. And Cork traditionally guys like Rory Dean and these guys, Ian McGuire, big men. Mm. Kerry were just stripping the ball off them. You look at what Mayo did, they they literally just ran over Galway. You look, look at even Tyrone doing it to Donegal, slightly different because Donegal went out to 14 men. But Tyrone for the last 15, 20 minutes were just flying up the pitch and, and teams didn't have an answer. And look, it, it's something we would have prided ourselves on with Dublin over the years. If we're in this game down the stretch, we'll burn teams. They won't last for us. And, and that is, when he, aside from, yes, maybe 
the, the top teams have maybe more talented players, they have more experience and things like that. But it's it's a worrying trend that, that like I say, look at what Tyrone did to Cavan as, as well. Cavan ran out of gas after 20 minutes and they're the Ulster champions. You know, the condition of the top teams, it's so obvious over the last three or four weeks. They are blowing teams away. And you're thinking, what are other teams doing? How, how, what, what are Cork doing? Like, Ronan McCarthy is Cork training on the beach in January. And, and, and then they go out and play this championship game and they're completely wiped. You know, is it, is it the right training they're doing? Is it just training A's that there's younger guys there and, and carry you maybe on the road a little bit longer that that, that builds up over time? It's, it's, a tr- it's not my area of expertise, but it's, yeah. it, it, it's, it's definitely a, a trend you've seen. The top teams, whatever about everything else, but they seem to just be physically mowing down opposition. Yeah, I couldn't understand with Keane O'Neill with Cork. It's it. I just don't think it's a physical thing like he would have had. Mm. In, in yeah, top. and that's what you that's what you'd assume. Yeah, but but, like, but on the pitch, it, it did not look like Kerry. No. Just literally, and, and there's a bit of maybe mentally as well that Kerry are on top, and you can see that with teams when, when the momentum starts shifting against you. You know, when you have the ball, when you, when Dublin have the ball, they're not wasting any energy. So they don't need to be overly fit. They can keep the ball for so long that that's you, you tire out more easily when you're chasing their tail and you're, you're running after it. So maybe there's a bit of that as well. But but if you look at that second half yesterday, it was just like men against boys. It is it, as harsh as that may sound. That that's what it. That's what that was the proof yeah. which we're seeing we, on the screen. We, you know, we have been seeing that over the last couple of years. And Max Shar on Instagram had a question: How can Galway and others get to the same condition and level of the Big Four? Is it easier said than done? I know that's not a, something you could answer right now straight away. I presume it's not. But Andy, can I ask you a follow-up to that? And you, we, we talked about Mayo's turnover earlier on. It's It stands out a lot that regardless of the players that retired, the players that have come through in Mayo over the last couple of years, talk about Oshin Mullen, talk about Matty Ruan, Owen McLaughlin, they've all got the same aerobic, aerobic capabilities. They're all kind of built and sculpted the same way. Mayo are clearly getting something right over the last decade, from under whatever age, all the way through, and they're continuing that through into, into senior level. Like Cork have won a minor title and an under-20 title in 2019. And maybe we'll see the, you know, the benefits of that in a couple of years. Mm. But Mayo have, have, have been able to bring players along over the last decade. Is there anything there that you've seen that, that you can pick out from that? Yeah, and I think you will see the benefit. Of, I think you will see Cork progressing. I thought last year was a really big one for them to lose against Tip. Just confidence-wise, I think it was huge. But I, I do think you'll see the benefit going and I do think that the right structure's in place. So let's just wait to see how that one unfolds. With Mayo, we have an obsession with wing backs. <laughs> like we, we actually we love wing backs. It was it's from the Mahan era, the Noel Canellis, the Fergal Costellos. These guys just loved like they we nearly like I'm not saying like of course you had Paul O'Shea, Tomas O'Shea, all these guys, Paul Kern. Remember the 90s Paddy, where mm. like it was Johnny McGurk from from Derry, it was Paul Kern, what a player! Do you know all these guys were just even Ger- Graham Gerdy played back there at times. So yeah. they, no, they were all just kind of forwards progressed into wing. Declan was yeah. Declan was hey, unbelievable. I wanted to be exactly. I wanted to be Philly Jordan when I grew up in 2005. Jo- so they were all running running wing backs. Do you know what I'm saying? And it's the best position on the pitch, lads. Yeah. And, and it's, a free, it's a free position. Just, yeah. just go forward. Go on. Well, someone else so, America, man. Like. Yeah, so we just produced, we just produced these players and where we've probably struggled to produce that but, real, like, over and over again, that corner, that silky corner forward. Yeah. Inner Brannock, actually, just yeah. to give him his kudos, yeah. Inner Brannock is, is saying that he's asking how are they developing these players that they aren't able to to produce enough corner forwards. What's well, going tr- on? It's it's trust, and it, every every county has has a tradition. Like, and, and our tradition is that we like physically developed players who can just move. And if you think about it, John Mahan was James Horan's manager. Joe, you know, there's a direct line there. Mahan came in, reinvented training down in Clare with like in night like in ninety two with Clare, I think it was, and then Lachlan took over the hurlers in, in Clare afters, and the two of them boys just went mad that way. Mayo did the same in terms of their training then in 96, 95, 96, 97. And Joe, you know, teams then had to catch up. And we just keep and whore now. What did Paddy say? His way of playing is forward mm. and his way of playing is guys with pace and moving them and getting the ball moving quickly as fast up the field as he can and what you need to do you need to stop me those runners so like what I would say is it's kind of a traditional thing 
But these are the players we really love. They're, they're the high catching players with the corner forward side of things. That's a trust level. In, in, in my view, it's a coaching thing where as a coach that you're not trying to overcorrect somebody that it like what Dave Billing said to, to Paddy, like mm. work on that left foot in Mayo, are we turning around saying to the young fella, are we turn around saying, don't be taking on that crazy shot. Do you know, and it's only a, a simple shift of mindset and it's where you're appreciated. And everyone ends up playing wing back. If you think about the half back line we produce, Donny Vaughan, Lee Keegan, Colin Boyle, Keith Higgins is this word. Then Paddy Durkin comes along. Now Owen McLaughlin. Then O'Sheen Mullen. Plunkett, these the, Cohen. Yeah, these are the players we produce. And it's uh, it's probably just the corner forward thing is probably just a coaching thing where every now and then an eccentric header like Mort comes along and just scores at will. And you, you trust him because he trains really well as well. And then you have a Killian who really fits into the team format. Even though he's the best scorer we have, he battles and tracks and tackles. But outside them too, then you know there there is a there is a there there is a gap of that really classy natural corner forward, and I, I think it probably goes down to underage coach. And sure, you had to run from wing back. You had to get up the other end of the field as quickly as you could. Who me? Yeah, you had to get out oh, of there. Too much competition. He wasn't fast enough. No, he was no. like, "Get me out of here." When, out I play, the when I play, I remember Mark and Paul Flynn, Paddy, in a. And, uh, a challenge match I think it was out in Port Mariner I don't know where we played it. some crazy place right. and I, I was playing wing back oh man he was running I said all I did was got the ball and kicked as far away from me as I could like, I was, <laughs> and, half volley down the pitch yeah, a little playmaker yeah took it in around took it in around the centre half back Paddy do you know what I mean uh, protected pass him on pass him yeah, on I, <laughs> he's not as bad as that one yeah I was protected but oh. yeah no listen it was um, it's great position but it, like we, we just produced him over and over again you know Paddy Andrews, Andy Moran has been talking up Tyrone all year long. You had you had been one of their early advocates at the start of the league as well. How do you see the Ulster final going this weekend? Tyrone Monaghan on Saturday. I think Tyrone will win, and I think they'll win convincingly. Um, based on, uh, I, I think, their cabin, their league finish was a bit of a shambles down at Killarney, and you could absolutely see a slight change in how they were setting up when the Ulster Championship started. It was really impressive against Cavan. I thought that was their best performance. They were finding that balance between, okay, we don't want to be totally man-on-man here. We want to keep some of our key guys up front and, and be that this kick-passing style, get the ball up the pitch a little bit quicker. But we're not going to throw the baby out with the bat water here. We're going to try and, and, and still keep that defensive solidity. There was a noticeable shift from the National League to the Ulster Championship that they were bringing guys back, like Richie Donnelly and, and Niall Sludden is back in the team. And they were getting that, getting bodies back behind the ball. That's you could see that against against Cavan. You could see it against Donegal then as well. The Donegal game was another step up from the Cavan game, and they're really impressive. Where I think and why I'm kind of very definitive of why I feel Toronto will win this game. Uh, for for much of Monaghan, I think Monaghan will have serious issues defensively dealing with with, with to Toronto. Our man scored two twenty one against Monaghan. He scored 14 points in the first half alone. It was, it was a brilliant game to watch. Do not get me wrong. It was an absolutely spectacular game to watch. Jim McGuinness doesn't think so, Patrick. Yeah, and I, I see Jim's thing. And I have to say, I, I agree with what Jim was saying. And we said this, all through the National League, the defensive nuances of the game, that there, there's no doubt there's a move away from that across the board. Just be careful here because there's going to be a headline coming out of this that Paddy Andrews agree with Jim McGuinness. So I just got to be clear on what part you agree with. Do you agree with it, it's less of an uh, attractive product uh, football right now? Or do you agree no, with the fact that defensive uh, football is screwed? I agree with what he, he said. that there's a, Without a doubt, there's, you can see by the scores. That you can see it in the scores being wrapped up across the board. The Ulster Championship is now probably the most entertaining provincial championship there is. So that, that just shows you I totally agree that Defensive systems are definitely not what they once were, but that's just the evolution of football. I mm. don't necessarily, where I disagree to a point is, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Like, I, I've seen Ulster Championship games, we all have our man on him maybe 10 or 15 years ago, and it's it's not great to watch. That match in Newry was spectacular to watch, but absolutely right. The defence on both sides, like some of the goals that went in in the first, first half, Darren Hughes' yeah. goals, oh my God, yeah. he literally walks through the centre channel by about four Armagh players. But on the flip side, I thought Monaghan were wide open. Wide open. In the first 12 minutes of that game, Reno O'Neill scores four points. 
that's just long balls being kicked in, a kick out, out to Armagh, out to the wing back, and launched in. And Andrew Murnan and Reno O'Neill are causing absolute havoc there. Replace them with Darren McCurry and Maddie Donnelly, a rejuvenated Maddie Donnelly, or a Colin McShane might get us there. There's an issue straight away. Conor McKenna probably won't start because he said, I'd say they're going to use him off the bench for impact. But there's an issue, I, I feel, for Manning. They could not deal with that against their man, throwing our level up. On, but then the most were inside, they're wide open for ours. L- like our man, I have a couple of notes there. They've two or three points in the first half. The 29th minute, Greg McKay goes up the centre half back. Three minutes later, Kieran O'Hanlon goes up. They literally jog into the centre channel. It's not even a sprint. A short kick up by our man, and Monaghan don't make one, don't make contact in that play once. Within 10 seconds, two and a half backs are up kicking the ball over the centre from the middle of the day. No one near them. Like, as good as McManus and Jack McCarran are, and cause a handful for teams, they're not great going back to their way. And that's that's the way they are. That's Banty set them up that way. Carl O'Connell wants to attack. Mac and Espy, mm. these guys, they're very, very open at the back, I feel. And that's from long kick passes in with Tyrone Lewis. But also, bear in mind how good Tyrone were in the second half. Tierney McCann, Niall Stodden, Conor Myler, Kieran McGeary. If there's one team that you don't want to play against, if, if you're susceptible to runners coming from deep, it's probably Mayo and Tyrone. They're the two teams that they just come at you in waves. And like I say, Tyrone's tails are up. And I just think, as, as brilliant the game Monaghan and Armand was, I think the defensive structure, unless there's serious changes to what Banty's going to do there, I don't think yeah. they have the personnel to do that. I, I think Tyrone will, will make hay there. Andy, or Saturday, um, sorry. Saturday, yeah. Andy, Galway in the first half filtered quite a lot of bodies back. Finnerty for the first 15 minutes, the only man up top. He had watched Comer play more of a half forward line. They had a lot of bodies back. Mayo probably found it difficult to get the running game going or they just couldn't get it going. They were blocked up quite a bit. But then, I'm not sure in the second half where the body's doing anything. Matthew Ruan sauntered through three or four tackles. Tommy Conroy burst through three or four tackles for a, for a point as well. It can't be that simple for Monaghan to just turn up now next week if they didn't have a right against Armagh to just say, right, we're going to play a bit deeper, a bit more defensive. Or can they? Can they turn it on defensively against Tyrone? I think it's a. I, I think Tyrone will win. I think it'll be closer than what Paddy thinks. Um, I think there's going to be an element in it um, where the emotional element of Monaghan is going to be hu- huge in the game. Uh, I think Donny Buckley is going to be huge for the two weeks they're off because Donny is a bit of a strange one where he sees Tyrone, Dublin, Kerry. And he would know them inside out where he'd study them from December, January, more so than he'd study anybody else. And I don't mean that, but he would. And then he'd know them inside out. Uh, the league game, it, just a couple of weeks back, going into the 69th minute, was 13 points to Manon, 11 points to Tyrone. And they end up having to equalise to make it 14 all over the last couple of years. Manon won last year in the league. Tyrone won 19. Like... Bonham bet them in Ulster and then Tyrone beat them in the semi final in 18. So, lads, and a draw this year. These guys traditionally have been really, really tight. And I do think Tyrone will win, but I think Monaghan will, Tyrone will struggle a tiny bit with them because Monaghan will hold the ball so much against them. I think Monaghan in this game will, are going to slow the game down to. To a I think they have to. I think, I think they, they have, have to. to. And I think you'll find they'll be using begging with nearly every third pass. I uh, reckon. Yeah. And I think they'll just recycle and recycle. If this goes if this goes to a 20-point game, I don't believe Monon will get anywhere near 20 points. I think they'll get to 15 or 16 points. If it goes to 20 points, Tyrone will win the game. And I think Monon are just going to slow it down. They're going to try to press the kick out and then they're going to try to win the ball back and slow it down again. And it's going to be that kind of recycling of a match. But, but that, that's the, the kick outs are going to be a very, very interesting thing. You've probably got the two, along with Patton, the two top goalkeepers in Ulster. Like Monaghan tried to press the Armagh kick out and look, they got some joy of it in the first half, but there was examples there where Armagh got it off short and just popped it over and they were clean through. So, so and that again, as good as Armagh are, thrown our level above that. You know, so, so finding that balance and Niall Morgan is, is a different keeper than the Hermann keeper. If they push up uh, and we've seen it against Donegal, they've got the, these two joints in the middle now in, in Conkle Patrick and Murphy yeah. there where, where they're looking to go long and get tap out, tap downs on to, to guys like McGeary and Myler and things like that. If Monaghan do push up, 
which was their tactic against their man, the kickouts, they, they could be wide open even more at the back. I, I don't know if they can afford to do that. No. And, and on the flip side, like, Beggins, Beggins wants to go long. He wants to hit that pocket that he always likes to hit. You've got two giants around the middle now for, for, for Tyrone who are going to try and clog up that space. It's an interesting one. Why I'm kind of more definitive for Tyrone, like I, say, I think they've improved massively. They're, they're starting to find their rhythm. And I'm just going off what I've seen from Monaghan. Unless there's big changes into what, how they approach this game and how they approach one, their, their kick-out strategy, but also their defensive system. I think the way they would have played against their mark completely and utterly plays into Tyrone's hands. So do they have their personnel to change that around? The matchups as well. Who, who, who are the matchups going to but, be? I, I but, can see Hamsey and Mac- McNamee picking up yeah. McCarran and McManus on the flip side. If Maddie Donnelly carries his form in, that's why it was such a big thing for Tyrone that Donnelly started to get, because he wasn't playing well before that. You, you know, who does Roy Wiley go on? McCurry, who do they put on? And Donnelly there, you, you know, and then if McShane and McKenna. McCann- Boyle would be on Donnelly, you'd imagine, because he'd be able to track him up and down the pitch. But but, yeah. but Paddy, Paddy, just on, I think you, just when you're talking there, it's nearly like a, a, the Monaghan team here, Mulligan, Brannigan, Connor, or Bannigan, isn't it? Connor McCarthy, yeah. Connor McManus, and if you have Jack McCarron in there, they're like forwards. You have a really, SBB wing forward. And yeah, but you, you have a really, back. But you have a really good point there because it's the, and I don't think I answered your question earlier, Tommy. I'd stuff it. I'd stuff it down. I said I'm going to say this anyway, but I didn't answer your question. <laughs> but, but to answer your question about clogging it, about clogging it, and if you put what you have said and what Paddy is just after saying there. They don't have the personnel to clog it. They don't. They've Bannigan, Conor McManus, McCarthy, Mulligan, uh, and that's five forwards. And then you've uh, uh, Carol O'Connell who wants to attack. You have McInnesby who wants to attack. So who does clog the space? And that's actually a really, I think that's a really valid point. I've sold it to Andy, have I? <laughs> well, well done. Of that, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 just I think, like that. Just no, like I, that. I think that is, and I like I know what they brought on. I know what they brought on the last day, the, the like against Tyrone, they brought on Dermot Malone, they brought on Niall Kern. You know, Conan Walsh, Fintan yeah. Kelly, like Banty could throw a fast one, lads. So, so, start so, start the old boys. Like the one thing I, I, I think he has to. I I, 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 t- I think he has to because with the personnel that's there, the style mm, of play. I, I, yeah. yeah. I, I think, I think right. they, they will struggle big time against but, against against this Tyrone team. The way he, they're playing at the yeah. minute. So the three subs, the three subs in the four line that he brought on, Dermot Malone. Niall Kearns, Kieran Hughes in the in the forward line in yeah. the in game in the fourteen in the fourteen all game. Sh- That's a very interesting point. They're the fellas that could pro- possibly clog that space. Shane Carey is a transition player who can play Carey, quite yeah. defensively yeah. as well. Yeah. Like and just to pick up on, I I think like Paddy has been this definitive before even the Armagh game, and I, I know you were Paddy, you were definitive about that the winners of throwing any goal to be going into the All Ireland semi finals. Um, I know you're definitive because Owen Sheehan couldn't believe it. He was like, "Why well, he's writing off Armagh and Monaghan this quickly," but. The thing about the Monaghan team there... That's what you're asking me to do. It's my job here. A little bit. I'm pushing a little bit. For it. But the thing about what Andy was saying there about the Monaghan lads slowing the game down and keeping the ball, like the one thing about this Monaghan group is, you mentioned a couple of young lads there, but outside of, say, Bannigan and outside of... Um, Mulligan. Oh, Mulligan. They're the, the under-20s. And Banty's experience. It's an incredibly experienced group. And it's yeah. a group that have been together. And they've always been against the odds. They've always been underdogs. And they love being underdogs. And they absolutely like revel in that situation. And in the last five minutes against Armagh, you rightfully hammered Armagh last week, Paddy, for the time to get the ball away. Do you know, and it was quite alarming how poor the decision-making was by them when they were a point up. But equally, Monaghan's ability to control that match in the last four or five minutes, I'm not going to say it's, it's, okay, I am going to say it. It was Dublin-esque in that four or five minutes. They kept the ball. They worked the scores to the right person. And they did it against Coway as well. Just that I have players yeah, there that are very I, I'd have, I would have huge admiration for, for what Monaghan did over the last decade. They were always a Celtic who's got the absolute maximum. Uh, absolute maximum. Vinnie Corey, Dick Clark, mm. and Paul Finley, these guys, McManus has obviously been doing it for so long. So, so there is, I agree with Andy, if they're going to win this game on Saturday, they need to slow it down. If they play it at breakneck speed, that's what that suits the throne. We've seen that the last thing that we're talking about the condition of teams like that I just don't know if the personnel to be able to manage that I, I'm basing this kind of definitive off of what we've seen so far today yeah like I have a lot of time for Monaghan I like say there's some amazing players but Manus is, is obviously incredible and the plaudits he gets and Banty's done a phenomenal job there over a number of years but 
you can't get away from the fact of how they were set up, the personnel they actually have at their disposal. Like I say, you're talking about bringing in some of those older players. That they are older players. You know, they've been on a lot of miles on the clock and you're chasing around these, like Toronto bringing in guys like Conor McKenna yeah. and guys. Throwbacks, you know, you, yeah. need, you need to have a lettuce, lettuce there. And again, also, Monaghan were eight points up against Armagh. And Armagh are a coming team, you know, they're, they're, they're a bit naive themselves, but they're, they're developing into a, a Division One team. They were eight points up. In the next 13 minutes, it was a 10-point swing. And Monaghan were out on their feet, on the ropes, and only for Conor McManus. Genius from Conor McManus, but also naivety from Armagh to give away my yeah. really yeah. silly freeze. True. Like, Armagh, Armagh really should have won the game. They, they showed up. Tyrone won't make those same mistakes. Yeah. And, and, and that's why I'm basing that. The swing, Monaghan out on their feet, they, they did not look like scoring over that, that last 10, 15 minutes until McManus took, took away his scruff for the neck and, and, and engineered a couple of frees himself. And that was also his good play, but also our man kind of struggling and a, and a little bit sloppy and a little bit silly at that stage of the game. I don't think Tyrone will give them that opportunity. And, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm more definitive. And I know Monaghan have a really good record and they, they bet them down and home at that time. McManus scored that absolutely outrageous point that they have a good record. On the right wing. Yeah, yeah. Phenomenal yeah. stuff. Phenomenal stuff. But, but I just don't see it this weekend just with the personnel, the setup that they have. I, I expect them to change it because it was so obvious that they, if they set up that way, they'd struggle against their own. Yeah. But I just, I, ju- I just think the way Tyrone are playing at the minute, they've found that balance we were talking about under, under Logan and Dewar. And it was a huge win for them against Donegal. Like, mentally, that is that is a big win to set them up for for the season. I I, I just don't see anything other than than a Tyrone win on Saturday. Andy, anything else you want to add to Monaghan Tyrone before we move on? No, just to really like it's the it's the like in terms of tactical battles, this is the one with most fascination for me. Like mm. last last weekend. It, it, there was no real like Sean Kelly going to midfield was the height of it really in terms of tactical stuff. Um, Jack Barry coming in obviously making that third midfielder, but it, this is the tactical battle which is going. There's going a lot of what's going to, we're going to see on the pitch is going to be dictated on what Banty's team do and Logan and Logan, Logan and Doers. Who wants to make the case for Kildare in the Leinster final? Or will I put it to you this way? Mark Scannon on Instagram wants to know where can Kildare hurt Dublin? And how, or how can they hurt Dublin? Yeah, look, if they're going to win the game, uh, look, I, I think they're going to... Kevin Feely would be a big loss if he's not there at midfield. They, they couldn't really afford to be without him. And we touched on it. Like, they were probably lucky to beat Westmead the, the way that second half panned out. If they're going to have a chance here on, on, on Sunday against Dublin, Daniel Flynn needs to have a huge game. As much as what we talked about Shane Walsh for Galway, Daniel Flynn needs to, to light it up on, on Sunday. They need Feely there. I think Owen Doyle went off for a hamstring injury. He's a big leader in the defence for them. Yeah. Um, and they need to show Dublin no respect. That, that would be, if you're looking at what did me do well, if you're, and I'm sure Jack O'Connor has looked at this over the last two weeks because they, I'm sure they've analysed that third quarter of what me did to take Dublin out of their comfort zone. It was a little bit of, of Dublin being sloppy up front, but that was kind of the pressure that, that me were putting on. And me just went for it. They played on the front foot. They had nothing to lose. They were 11 points down at half time. That's a brave thing to do because it can go either way. If you go out on the front foot against Dublin, you're leaving the back door open and Conor Callan and these guys can have a field day. But if Kildare are, are, are going to have a chance at this, they've got to be really aggressive. They've got to be in Dublin's faces and they need huge performances from their key players. Um, and that, that's a big ask, but that's what they're going to have to do. Is there anything more to showing them no respect Apart from like getting in their faces aggression, what, what do you mean by that? No, no respect. They've got to push up on Evan Comfort's kickouts. They, they, there's no point in letting Dublin have the ball short or letting him chip it out to the wings because Dublin, they'd say, fine, if you're sitting back, we'll just keep the ball for 10 minutes. Me try to, we're kind of caught between two stools and then Dublin just keep the ball for six minutes. Someone eventually switches off and make it in for a goal. Yeah. yeah you, have to, you, you have to be brave. You have to be brave. You've got to push up on kickouts. You've got to back your defenders. There's got to be times, lads, where Mick O'Grady or, or these guys, you're going to be one on one with Conor Callahan, and, and you've got to be able to semi deal with them as best as you can. That's why someone like Owen Doyle missing, if he is, but with that hamstring injury. Oh. You know, you've got to play in the front foot. Why were Mayo always 
putting Dublin to the Penrith Colours because they have the athleticism, the physicality, and, and just like I say, touch up the balls to go for it. You know, it's if Kildare and, and to be fair, Jack O'Connor knows this. He's, he's coached against Dublin and Kerry, a slightly different team, but you've got to go in there and, and play on the front foot. And like that, that was the only that was the big difference. What me did in, the, in that third quarter. All of a sudden, Shane McIntyre, and Brian Menton, and these guys were getting in big contact, hits and, contact, and turnovers. Yeah. If you let Dublin keep the ball for five or six minutes, you're you're. It's not going to be enough. They're too good to. They're not going to give it back to. I didn't know about Owen Doyle. That'd be a huge loss if yeah. if he's gone. I think it's. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's 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 a monumental loss to be honest. If if he if he's missing, um, but I'm not. Just up, Andy, like he, he, he's he's in a, in his thirties and a Hampshire yeah, injury um, to turn yeah. around in two weeks is you don't know how bad it is. Like me and Tommy were at the game. Feely looked like a bad one. Yeah, judging by the, the, the kind of crutches it was, and it stuff. Was after, a collision yes. though, it could have been a knee. It like, could have kind of been a bruised knee or. A dead it, it, it's hard. It, it's hard to know, but, but like I say, yeah. we're touching on teams with depth and squad. Yeah, like if Kildare are gonna have a chance, they need these guys on the pitch. Yeah. Really, and Do- know, so. Do- 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 Doyle is such a he gives them a bit of calmness, like because a lot of what Kildare does is that, like even though he hand pass that ball away, going in in and goal, play, <laughs> but he does. He gives them a sense of calmness around the place, and the, mm. the Kildare guys trust him. So if he's missing, it is it, that's a huge loss. I I think that's a bigger loss if I'm being honest. The the thing I would say about um, about Kildare, I'm not picking on Westmead because you know how much I think how well they're coached. But we used Westmead as an example against Cork last week when McCartan went through and he had two goal chances to miss the two of them. Mm. And we, we pointed that as a an element where oh, Cork could be in a bit of trouble here against Kerry. Westmead scored 18 points on Kildare. Like you two boys were at the game, eighteen points, missed a lot of chances. A lot of goal chances. Oh, yeah, scored two, two lads. Glorious goal chances. And like you, like the the stuff that Dublin are listening to over the ne- next couple of weeks. Like Paddy's definitive there on Tyrone. I think Tyrone will win by slight margins, but Paddy is going strong on them. I, I I'm going strong on Dublin. I think this is going. Well, so to, am I, by the way. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I, I, I think this is going to be like Dublin will be a bit wound up, dangerous. dangerous. They're angry. Ah, uh, dangerous when they're wound up. Do you know, and they're, they're there, and people are saying, "Oh, they're fallible." And if you look at the stats about it, Mayo had a bad quarter, twenty minutes yesterday. Kerry had a bad fifteen minutes against Cork. Dublin had a bad fifteen minutes against me, then it's nearly like the world is shutting down. Like they've they've created that highest standards for themselves. It's it's um yeah, I, I pity Kildare. I, I I go back to Jack O'Connor's interview after the West Media. I mean, Jack O'Connor's a fighter and he's don't like to be fair, like he's got them to division one, he has them in a Leinster final, no matter how this result goes on Sunday. He but his interview after the game was we're not just going up to make up the numbers, but he also put in that we've made Division One and we've made the Leinster final. So, <laughs> he was so, taking that box just in case. Yeah, he, he, he and, and like that rings in my ears. And I'm not saying he is definitely not going up to make up the numbers. We all know Jack O'Connor. We've seen him now for the guts of 20 years. He is a winner at all costs. But this game, lads, is it's Dublin's chance to really make to really make a statement. For the last five years, particularly last year, we've been saying Dublin haven't got a challenge in Leinster. Oh, it's going to come against them and they go to a semi final and final. They've now got a challenge in Leinster. Yeah. But Sunday, I don't know, Paddy, you probably know more about the injuries. I think you're going to see every player that's available to Dublin on that field on Sunday. And I think you're going to, and they're going to put down a statement. And if Owen Doyle, that's why I kind of grimaced when I heard that he was in. Mm. If he's out, I didn't actually realize that. If mm. he's out, Poor oh, lads, I'm telling you, because when you're sorry, no, I'm, I'm harping on it. But if when you're playing against Dublin and they're holding the ball for so long, the discipline you need in your defending is unbelievable. And nobody's doubting what Kildare have up front. There's the two Flynn's, um, sorry, Highland, the, Jimmy Highland, uh, yeah. Jimmy Highland, Neil Flynn, and Danny. Yeah, he, he bet me all against uh, in the 20s by himself a couple of years ago. Mm. Uh, like top quality players, but their discipline against Dublin needs to be spot on for 75, 76 But that's, D- Dublin just uh, wait for someone to switch off. Yeah, that's and the I, thing. And and the, I Jaws, just, the Jaws yeah, music yeah, last week was, if you was keep Paddy going. Long enough, someone, someone has got to switch off. They're going to break the line and away they yeah. go. And lads, that is going to happen on Sunday. I'm te- like it is going to happen. And I think Kildare are going to get a bit of a trim on, on Sunday. Oh, I, 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 I think Dublin are going to win this game convincingly as well. And, that's what Tommy's going to say. Try and make a case for Kildare. Saying that's 
even if all of those things do happen. But Daniel Flynn has a brilliant game. Neil Flynn kicks over another seven or eight points and he nails his freeze. Kevin Feely's playing and Owen Doyle is playing. I still think Dublin are going to win this game convincingly. If you're looking from their side, I think the first half against Mead was a reaction and a response to the poor performance against Wexford that, okay, we're going to come out, set our standards here, let's start moving the ball really crisply again. That's why I said it after the Mead game. I think it might be the worst thing that that poor third quarter because they would have analysed that and Desi Farrell and the coaches would be looking at going right. But what we we were a little bit sloppy in front of the goal. Why was that? Why were we all of a sudden allowing me to get contact on us? Like, like teams are always trying to physically try and get that Dublin. But why are we letting them if we're carrying the ball into contact? Is that bad decision made by the players or is there not much movement? The front they would have looked at all of these angles. And again, I expect a response against Kildare. Um, and the important thing, if you're from Dublin's point of view, you, you are it's getting to the stage now. The championship's over in one of the four or five weeks. Dublin supporters are going to be hoping that, that we see John Small, that we see Owen Merchant, that we see Robbie McDay back because that, that that changes things for Dublin. Like, like I say, a couple of years ago, a couple of years ago, the depth in the squad, if someone was injured, you didn't really notice. If someone was out, it just someone else just came in. It was kind of like for like. Whereas now I'm looking at who, if you're the Dublin defence, you're looking at, well, we need to man-mark Neil Flynn and Daniel Flynn. They're the two scorers. So if John Small is back, he's made. There's Neil Flynn. John Small is going to mark him. Um, does that allow Mick Fitz or to put James McCarthy back and pick up Daniel Flynn for that athleticism? If you're missing those guys, then you're having to move a couple of pieces around. I think Dublin supporters will definitely be hoping for those guys. And I think Dublin need them to come back because... Like I said, the championship's going to be it's moving along. You, you need your key players back on the pitch. And it gives you something on the bench, uh, Paddy, then. Again, like, all of a sudden, your bench looks a bit better. Like, where mm. if Dean Rock is back, Bugler plays, just say, for instance, then you have you have Costello or Small then. Like, like yeah. that's, a hu- that's a huge change then. Like, yeah. you know, like, if you Paddy Small coming on your corner back, oh, Jesus, that's, you know. And he's like, a point to prove. He's a point yeah, to prove as well. A, a po- point to prove on Hungary. That was always a strength for Dublin. That was a huge, huge strength for Dublin. And, and that's... Paddy, when you released your retirement statement in January 2021, did you realise when you made that big announcement that you were gone? Did you realise that the strength and depth was was as possibly waning the way it was? Or is it just the fact that those injuries have coincided with three or four more players stepping away? Did it feel like that in January? Probably not as as, as much because... Look, like I said, the injuries, like I said, injuries were never something Dublin really spoke about. It was because there was just... You probably had 25 to 26 players in that squad that could play and genuinely play at the, at, at the highest level. Um, and that was a luxury. Not many teams have that. No. And Dublin had it for, for seven or eight years. Whereas, but, but, and also the flip side as well. Like I, I played for 12 years. There's a lot of us in, the, in that group, you know, Kev Mack, Phil McMahon, Don McConley, Paul Flynn. You know, nobody goes on forever. And that, that group of players was coming to the end. Is there the same quality there at the minute that, that Dublin had in 2016, 17, 18, when they're probably at their absolute peak? I, I don't think there is. You look at the bench the last day, you look at it now, where is the impact coming from? And this is where, like, I don't think it's going to be too important on Sunday, but if you're looking at the top teams, you look at the impact Tyrone had off the bench against Donegal. McKenna, McShane, these guys, Turner McCann comes on and scores three points. You look at Kerry yesterday, and that, that's Kerry yesterday with Tommy Watts, Killian Splann, and these guys coming on. That reminded me of Dublin back then. Those guys, even though they were winning by 15 points, were coming on, diving blocks, chasing down kickouts, taking the right option because they're just dying to get a game. Yeah. They just want to be on the pitch. Peter Key, please pick me. I'll do anything. That's what it was like with Dublin for years. No matter who, and that breeds that consistency. There was never a drop off. It's that ruthlessness. And Kerry have that. And you look at the difference Mayo had with guys coming off the bench yesterday. The two McLaughlin's, along with everything else, help change the game. Dublin have had that and taken it for granted for probably seven or eight years that even if we're not playing well, we've guys to roll in and it's going to cause havoc for the opposition. You're looking for Sunday for those guys to come back from injury so they have those options off the bench. because It hasn't happened so far this season. And like I say, that is a big challenge for them. That's what Dublin... 
supporters and what Desi Farrell are going to be looking for because it's going to start mattering. Benches and the depth of squad is going to start yeah. mattering when you get into the all Ireland series. There's no two ways about it this season more so than ever. But I, I thought of you yesterday, Paddy, when I seen Tyg Morley coming up kicking, kicking, kicking a point. Comes off the yeah. bench, up he goes kicking a point. And like you could see the Kerry boys, it meant something to them because he kicked a point because he's fighting. Like it's it's yeah. a funny day. I don't think many people, but it, when you notice it, 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 was, it was huge. But you go to the strength and depth and you have one of Rock, Costello, Small coming on. You have Robbie McDade coming on. And then all of a sudden, Paddy, you have Basquel coming on, then third instead of first. Mm. You know yourself, that, that makes a big difference. Do you understand? Know if, he, yeah, if, he's, if he's the third man in instead of being the first man in, it makes a big difference. Like. Yeah. It, it's like it's impact. It is. Who, who and, and it's nearly as a coach are kind of saying, well, who makes... Is Dean Rock a better impact off the bench or is he better starting? I think he's, he's obviously better starting because yeah. my idea with an impact player coming on is someone like Owen o- McLaughlin yesterday where he's just lighting it up. If you're like... Or, or, or Paddy Small comes on, for example, and you're... Or Kev Mack used to be the, the, the go-to guy. If he comes on and you're a cornerback, like, this fella's just going to run straight at me. I'm knackered. And this fella is just, no matter where he gets the ball, he's putting his head down, he's taking me on. He's going for gold. That, that, that's impact off the bench. And, and like I say, I don't think it's going to be too relevant on Sunday. I think Dublin yeah. will win this game comfortably. But when you're getting down to the, the nuts and bolts of it, and the top four, I, I think the semi-finals will be, be, be Tyrone against Kerry, I think it'll be Mayo against Dublin. They're the four most physical, athletic teams. They've got stacked benches, the, the other three teams. Dublin need to be able to, to deal with that as well. I still yeah. think they've the best 15, but there's no doubt there's been, in terms of squad quality, there, there's been a drop. It was just unbelievable what they had for four or five years there with those group of players and, and that's a rarity it's probably more normal now than what they have yeah I was just wondering when you left did it feel like that but it's probably been more pronounced over the last couple of weeks and months we'll see what happens with the pa- match they panelists there on Sunday I think you're going to be there for off the ball as well on Sunday Paddy yeah back in uh, uh, again yeah. yeah so we'd be in Crow Park for that Andy you'll have the feet up at home watching it um, just to stick with Dublin for a minute we have a question in on, on Conor Callaghan <laughs> Uh, can you ask Paddy what it was like when Conor Callaghan broke into the squad first did the lads immediately know that there was a superstar in the camp and also can you talk about a style of play in matches he can be so quiet on the scoreboard one day and go out the next day and do whatever he wants so in January 2016 Jim Gavin sprung Conor Callaghan from the bench in a league game against Dublin in the, in the last couple of minutes of that game he never appeared again in the league he went off and he played with the 21s I think he scored 324 as Dublin um went through their own 21 campaign that year, makes his championship debut in Leinster against Leash and he kicks a point. That's in 2016. You mentioned 2016 yeah. being the peak of that Dublin six in a row team and the, the strength and depth that you had. Did you notice Conor Callaghan coming in? To, to be honest, probably not to where he is now. You, you know, and even like I'd say that even when Fenton came in in 2015, I don't think he played a lot underage and then he started a game up in Clonus against Monaghan at wing forward and he scored a goal and all of a sudden, like, Jesus, this guy could be something. I think he got an all-star that year. Jim's style was that he'd kind of bring through the younger players and have them on the squad for a year before they played. He did the same with Brian Howard. He did the same with Niall Scully. That these guys came in and trained around the squad for a year. They might have gone a couple of minutes in, in league or in one of the Leinster Championship games. But, but hand on heart, probably not at that point. Like, for me as a forward we probably had 12 forwards already there the Kevin Mack and Onogar and these guys so so you're kind of you're just trying to keep your, your place in the team you're trying to play as well as you can you knew he's obviously talented because if you're in that Dublin squad like you say at that particular time you, you, you've got to be a serious player because there was no fools there <laughs> like, like you weren't just being brought up for training because you might have something you definitely had quality there but to go on and, and, and what he's done over the last number of years probably not there wasn't a sense that you're seeing physically his development he's an absolute yeah. animal uh, to, to, to what he's developed into and his leadership and his mentality you, you definitely notice that that this is a serious guy here that, that you know he's going to put a shoulder to the wheel but uh, I'd be lying if I said in 2016 looking at him in his first year that's, I'd say that's pretty rare for anyone that you come in and go this guy's going to be one of the best best double forwards ever really. and was there, was there a moment where you went Right. I think this, this, lad, this, this lad is going to be... This, the 17 Leinster final, I think. Didn't he play centre-forward? We were there, and I think he scored 10 points. 
Yeah. That was at 17 was his first year start. And I think he was on the freeze as well, I think. And then all Ireland, all Ireland semi-final against Tyrone. He, 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 he got the goal against Tyrone. He got the goal in the final then against Mayo. But I th- think the Leinster final was like, this guy's, this guy's here. Like to score 10 points in the Leinster final as a young guy, you were thinking, Right, this we're on, we're onto something here. But but to be honest, I'd say out of all those players coming through, the only two in the very first year were probably Kilkenny and Jack McCaffrey. That that they they just came in and they were just freaks. Like Kilkenny came in under Pat Gilroy. He actually started he started the twenty twelve All Ireland semi final. He scored three points. People, there was a lot people of, kind of forget that that he just came in under Jim. But there was a lot of Pat, talk about Australia back then around Kieran Kilkenny as well. They yeah, might be tempted but, to go. But when he came in, you knew straight up. You knew this guy's. He went. he went and he came he, back. He went and then he came yeah. back after after a couple of weeks. But, but McCaffrey was the other one as well. And McCaffrey came in and the first train it's actually just took off. And you're like this <laughs> the little belly on him and the little fuzzy hair. And you're thinking, is this guy he's won a prize or something to come in as a fan for the day? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like we'll sign his jersey for him. And then he just takes off the train and go, Jesus Christ, this is something special. And it was. And but that, that, they're probably the two out of everyone, like like Khan and Fenton, what they've got on and, and done. But, but it was probably McCaffrey and Kieran, but I won straight away. You're and right, why Kieran? Like, because he was more of a full forward at underage level. I, I think Kieran probably had the most high profile underage career, that he was just a scoring machine. And like I said, he came in and Pat started in 2012. And Dublin were the All Ireland champions at that point. And he only came kind of came in halfway through the summer and he started that game against Mayo. I think Alan Brogan was injured. So, so there was a spot there. And he scored three points. And, and Mayo, like, kind of, they all hammered Dublin that day. Dublin kind of brought it back a little bit towards the end. But but you're, there, here's a guy starting for the All Ireland Champions. I think he was 19, eight, maybe 18, 19 at the time in, in a big game. Again, Pat Gilroy did not suffer fools gladly either. If he was in that team, you knew he was going to be serious. So you definitely could see those two, even and more so. He was grown man at 19, Paddy. Yeah, he, 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 he was. was compared, and that's why compared to Jack, probably. Didn't have that look about him, but if you were taking Mannion, Fenton, Con O'Callaghan, these guys that went on incredible careers, it probably wasn't straight away that they were saying they're going to go on to that level. That's just a credit to them and the work they've put in and how they've developed them. And also the environment they were put into, that it was like, okay, you have the talent, but you've got to work hard and put everything with it, you know. So it was the perfect learning ground for them as well to, to, to kind of develop. And that's what they're trying to do with these younger guys coming through now. Yeah, I think 2017 was the point when the rest of the country was going. The production line in Dublin is never, ever, ever going to stop. When you mm-hmm. had Conor Callan doing what he was doing at that age. Um, we'll see. It hasn't stopped yet. Uh, Andy, I was going to come to you on Con, but we, we might hold it. And I might get your thoughts on Con another day because it's we're, we're just over an hour and a half into the podcast. And I want to get your score of the week and your moan of the week. A few questions that I want to mention. Kevin Gibb wanted to, wanted us to talk about Kevin McLaughlin turning the game for Mayo, winning breaks, and with his with his kicking and his energy. We talked about Kevin earlier on the podcast and his performance. Mark Dunne, who wanted to hear your thoughts on Matty Ruan's performance, we'll get into a bit there about what we want to see with Fenton and Ruan. Barry Dardis wants to know who your player of the year so far is, but I think we'll hold that thought until after mm. the provincial finals next week, mm. and maybe then at the top of the podcast, I might get you to give your your shout for the player of the year so far. Um, Mark wants to know: Were either of you superstitious? And who was the most superstitious in the Mayo and Dublin panels? If you weren't superstitious, just we'll, we'll move on. Uh, no, I was a routine man, though, but I wasn't. Uh, mm. If something went out of my routine, it wouldn't have affected me. Are you, what are you talking? Socks up a certain height? We know that. Ah, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'd I, I be talking like doing my walks and listening to my stuff. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, do, doing my things like during the week. But if something went wrong, it wouldn't have affected me badly. Do you know? Okay. So okay. I wouldn't call it a superstition. Who's the most superstitious? It has to be them crazy. The keepers has to be, haven't they? They're nuts. <laughs> they all the same. They all, they all do something quirky, don't they? I think, think, they? think you're, we're asking Paddy for a bit of insight here, are we? I wasn't superstitious. I'm struggling. I'm struggling. Yeah. Who was? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. yeah. It's kind of like one of those things that was a big thing in, in Ireland and the GA 20 years ago, maybe. Just maybe not anymore. Or the same shorts or the same socks. Oh, Something like that, that, maybe, yeah. Score the week. Ooh. I, I'd actually, I'd give my one, right? I thought Comer's going. I thought Shane Walsh. Yeah. It's nearly a frustrating thing looking back because it, it shows what Galway can do. It shows what Shane Walsh can do. Like, 
like he gets the ball on the sideline and it's like Aiden O'Shea <laughs> or like right, Aiden, Aiden doesn't have a fucking prayer <laughs> catching him but then Paddy Dirk Paddy Dirk comes across and I've been that guy uh, Aiden O'Shea. we were up against the Jeff McCaffrey or someone and trying but to Aiden, Aiden actually just points oh, no, at Dirk like when yeah, you go exactly. he's like when you go when you go yeah, he knows himself so he takes it off but then he burns Dirk and it the outside as well and that is serious like, not many people do but, that and it's just the kind of the nonchalance of it it was we just were, like he doesn't even look like he's sprinting. And it's like we touched on Daniel Flynn last week with the goal he got against Westmead. It's just an expert. There's not the elusiveness, the, the speed at which they're going, the control. Not many players have that. And if that just showed, if Magic could go, he could get consistency in this. Pops it across the corner, right decision, brilliant play. And it's like Shane Walsh, how is this guy not one of the best players in the country? And then... It just fell apart after that for, for Galway. But I thought that was just a, br- a brilliant play. It's yeah, what, as forwards or supporters you want to see, it was just like, Jesus, that is that is top class. I, I obviously seen it in the flesh, was right above it. That goal came from initially, Johnny Heaney overturns the ball in the corner. I think it's Ryan O'Donoghue who just doesn't keep possession. And the Galway lads get away with it. It ends up going to Gleeson and you're thinking, what's Gleeson going to do here? Picks out a nice pass, pass to Liam. Liam Silk. Silk is going down the line and there's three Mayo boys coming from. I think it's Damien Comer saying, give it back to Shane Walsh. He flicks it back to Walsh. <laughs> he's 55, 60 yards from goal underneath the Hogan. And as you said, Paddy, he's sauntering. But there are three Mayo boys boxing him in there. Ah, it was just classy. And you kind of felt like it was going to happen as he took off. It was just, it was magic. I don't even care that it was borderline steps. I think he kind of got fouled by Derek and going across him. Andy, any other shouts? I know that Kerry's second goal, Paul Ganey's goal, I kind of loved how David Moran collects it, gives it to Jack Barry, 50-yard pass to Sean O'Shea, gathers it. Now, there's an acre of space, but I just really yeah. like that element of it, the quick hand passes, and it leads to the, the goal for Ganey then. And it, was very, right. it, was, it was a very unusual kind of Karen's, Kerry scoring display. There was nothing, like, that's what you're picking out. Do you know, it was one mm. of those. Like, Tommy Walsh is off the left, was nice, and yes. a few others. But, <laughs> but they, they, um, he was just rubbing salt into uh, to Clifford's room, doesn't he? But they, 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 um, I thought Matty Ruan's goal, that's a superb, uh, but yeah. not my bias. Like, yes, you could argue what are all the goal boys doing, but it's uh, it was a great finish, wasn't it? Yeah, it's from, a bit, once you're getting into the position, it was a really calm finish through the legs. Yeah, like, you have, the, you have the best player on the field, he sets up the first penalty, is wins the first penalty, scores the vital goal. Ryan O'Donoghue's whose goal that was disallowed it was a beautiful goal. Ah, the uh, Nudge lads was magic. It was ah, brilliant. Yeah. He got ah, away with it for yeah. a point. Connor Lane, what's the story? Uh, you were out about him last week, Tommy. I'm not saying uh, I'm you're going to mention Connor Lane again, no? Yeah. No. <laughs> so there was, a, there was a few it wasn't one of those I, I think Shane Walsh's first point was majestic some yes. of uh, yes, uh, I think there was good, a good point scoring in it but it was it was just one of those weekends where it was more of a transition scores for Mayo and then yeah. Kerry scores were Brian just, Hurley got a lovely one lovely, lovely goal Jason but a lovely goal, goal as well, as well. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it's like this fella's going to get hot and then kind of just died out from similar yep. to the team you know Moan of the week Andy Moran Moran's Moan of the Week. We're going to patent this. We're going to get it sponsored. Yeah, geez, do. Just as long as you pay me for it, I don't mind. Yeah. Uh, the, <laughs> the, uh, Money the never mo- sleeps. Hey, the movement was. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Edit that out. Yeah, Edit uh, that out. I'm going to start talking about my job next week. You, you know? have to. You have to, man. Um, no, I don't <laughs> really have a mo- I don't really have a Moan, really. I think it's. Uh, I, I, I'd feel sorry for Shane Walsh, if I'm being honest. Um, not because he got injured or anything like that. I just think. Paddy is saying there he should be one of the best players in the, in the in the country, but we mentioned another guy there. If Khan doesn't do it over the years, Kilkenny has done it, or Scully has done it, or Fenton has done it. Joe, you know, he's had help. Like if Clifford doesn't perform the last day, Sean Shea does it. Do you know, like Body, Tom Gainey, Sullivan Gainey comes off. You know, yeah, again he gets back. Like like Shane Watch puts them in the position to win the game, and. None of the rest of the boys responded in the second half, and I would. Yeah. But I would. But I think that's that's the top teams. The, that, the top uh, teams have that depth, and and, and again, yeah. it's you're looking at Monaghan have have McManus, and McManus will play in any team. But okay, Jack McCarran or Conor McCarthy at different times can kind of come mm. in with scores. But it's no secret the best teams that yeah. win the All Irelands they have guys. You're not just relying on one guy because it's ultimately you just won't get over the line. It's so rare that a team which was one marquee forward can win the honour. You need, like Dublin have had that success, the great Kerry teams, the Tyrone teams, it was mm. Dewar, it was Stephen O'Neill, it was Mulligan, it was Peter Canavan. That is the difference. And I know as good as wing-backs are, we're talking about it, 
if you're all Ireland winners, you usually have two, three, four mm. top forwards. And Galway, that's why Comer is so important to them. And, and he's kind of, he's probably dropped off with injuries and stuff like that from 2018 when he was yeah. at his peak. And, and that's that's ultimately what Park Joyce is trying to find. And yeah. you're talking about, he's looking to the bench, who could he bring on? Or he doesn't fancy much what's on his bench. Mm. If Shane Walsh doesn't do it. But that's that's the level goal we're at. And if they're going to be all Ireland contenders, they need to find two or three those forwards because Tyrone with McCurry and Donnelly and these guys, Kerry with the lads, Dublin with their guys. And that's what Mayo are trying to find to take the next step themselves as well. You know, So that, that is the difference, having those guys that can shoot the lights out. Well, we've hit the overtime. It's not like us, lads. Thanks very much for, for sticking <laughs> around and chatting away to me today. Um, this is episode 12 of the Football Pod with Paddy and Andy. Paddy Andrews and Andy Moran. Lads, thanks very much. Paddy, I'll see you on Sunday. Looking forward to it. Should be a good day with you. Yeah, Andy, thanks a million. We'll be in touch. Boys, enjoy it. Thanks, lads. Go on. Take it easy, gents.